I'm Kathy Wren at AAAS, the nonprofit science society that publishes the journal Science. I'm talking today with Dr. Svante Pabo of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. His research team has sequenced the Neanderthal genome and is reporting their results in Science this week. Dr. Pabo, how long have you been working on this project? So we worked on this project actively and concentrated way since 2006. And in this time, we then sequenced approximately 1.1 billion DNA fragments from Neanderthal fossils and puzzled together about 60% of the Neanderthal genome. And your team also sequenced the genomes of five modern day humans from different parts of the world. Could you explain how you used that information in your study? So that was really to compare present day humans to the Neanderthals in an unbiased way. So there is of course a lot of knowledge about variation in the human genome today, but it's very biased. For example, people of European descent have been studied much more than others. So we know Europeans just look more variable when we look in databases because of that. So to study variation in an unbiased way, we sequence these five individuals, two from Africa, one from Europe, one from China and one from Papua New Guinea, and use that information to find variable positions and then look what the Neanderthal looked at those positions. And we use that two places in the paper, one where we look for positive selection in humans since we separated from Neanderthals, and the other place is to look for admixture from Neanderthals into the ancestors of present-day humans. Okay, and your result there is that humans and Neanderthals do appear to have interbred to a small extent. So how do you know this? So we have tr three lines of evidence we present in the paper that point to this admixture from Neanderthals into present day people in Eurasia, so people outside Africa. The first is that if we compare a chromosome from an individual from say China, and one from Africa at positions where they vary from each other. And then we ask, how often does the Neanderthal match the Chinese individual and the African individual? If the Neanderthal didn't contribute anything to neither of these groups, it should be 50-50. But it turns out that in four or five percent of cases, is the Neanderthal closer to the people from outside Africa, be they from China, Europe, or Papua New Guinea. The second line of evidence is that we look for parts of the genome where the Neanderthal is particularly close to the reference human genome. There may be many reasons for that, for example, that those are regions of very low mutation rates. But if that is true, if we then compare that part of the reference genome to another present day human, and we compare actually to Craig Venter's genome, then that should also be very close. And we find the opposite. So regions where the Neanderthal is very close to the reference genome, are particularly diverged, particularly different from Craig Venter. So this argues that these regions came into modern humans from some other source, presumably than the Neanderthal. And the third line of evidence is that when we look for regions in the genome that are particularly variable outside Africa, and little variation in Africa. These are unusual parts of the genome because normally we have the opposite pattern, more variation in Africa. When we identify 12 extreme, the most extreme such regions, in 10 of those 12 cases, does the Neanderthal carry this variant that is so variable outside Africa and not the one that is inside Africa. And what do you consider the most likely scenario for when and where this interbreeding may have taken place? So, since um, we see this pattern in all people outside Africa, so not just in regions where Neanderthals existed in Europe and Western Asia, but also in China and in Papua New Guinea, we speculate that this had happened in some population of modern humans that then became the ancestors of all present day non-Africans. And the most plausible region is in the Middle East, where the first modern humans appear before 100,000 years ago, and where there were Neanderthals until at least 60,000 years ago. 
And of course, modern humans that come out of Africa to colonize the rest of the world have to pass through that region. So it's sort of a natural place to speculate that this would have happened. Dr. Pavo, you mentioned earlier that another part of your study looked for positive selection in humans since we separated from Neanderthals. So this refers to genetic changes that spread quickly through the early human population, presumably because they offered some sort of advantage. Could you give us some of the highlights of what you found in this area of your research? So that is the other part that I find fascinating, actually, perhaps even more than the interbreeding is that the Neanderthal genomes allows us to look for positive selection in humans and since we separate from Neanderthals by looking at places in the genome where the Neanderthal fall outside the variation of modern humans for a large section of the chromosomes. That hints that something has swept through the genomic gene pool of humans in that region. So we make a first sort of screen for that and find the 20 top candidates. And it's interesting to see that among them are, for example, three regions that contain genes that are involved in cognitive development. So these are genes that when they are mutated in humans give problems such as autism or schizophrenia. And there's also a gene in there called RUNEX2, which affects uh, skeletal development in the cranium and in the rib cage and in the clavicle that's even reminiscent of to some extent the differences you may see in skeletons between neanderthals and modern humans in all these cases this requires much much more work this is really just hints at what genes one should now study and i'm sure we and many other groups will be doing that Okay, well thank you very much for talking with me today, Dr. Pavel. Thank you.